Let's right. See. The microphones are on. Are we on? Or are we on? Yes, we're on. Mm -hmm. OK. I've been asked to remind everybody not to leave after this panel, because we have one more. And then you can have your drinks. But we haven't, I, have, I, was, I wasn't asked to tell you, but the doors have been locked. So <laughs> I'm sure that's illegal. Maybe that could be funded later. Uh, so uh, uh, we've covered a lot of ground today. And at least to some degree, the earlier panels have been somewhat UK focused. And that kind of reflects the development of the market here. And so this session is about uh, opportunities in Europe, more broadly speaking. And so the three panelists are all based and working in continental Europe. And so uh, my name is Mark Dorf. I'm the head of the international corporate practice here at Brown Rudnick. You've seen a number of my colleagues today. And we're happy to have you all here. A lot of old friends and uh, a great location and a nice turnout. So thank you again for being here. If you gentlemen would like to introduce yourselves, Carlos, please. Thank you, Mark. My name is Carlos Hara. I'm a restructuring and special situations partner at Cuatricasas, Spain, and I devote half of my time to litigation funding. Uh, Hugo Lestiboudois. Uh, I work for Sips Capital, which is a Swiss alternatives manager, and you know we run a legal assets practice there, uh, and we specialize in anything uncorrelated or anything non-cyclical generally. I'm uh, Chris Alberting Time. Uh, I work at Bureau Brandeis. We have an office in Amsterdam and an office in Paris. I'm a litigator, and um, we uh, dedicate our time uh, for a large extent to class uh, class actions. Okay, so to start. I think from, uh, Hugo, if you don't mind, from the investor perspective, just generally, as you look across Europe, what kind of claims are you really looking for? And one of the obvious challenges and perhaps advantages is you have different jurisdictions and different rules and things. And so how do you assess the claims with all of the different systems that you might have to be dealing with across Europe? I mean, Europe is, uh, is the ultimate diversifier from a financial perspective, right? I mean, litigation funding or legal assets generally within an asset allocation are decorrelated, diversifying. But when you think about how you can build a portfolio across European cases, uh, types of claims, jurisdiction, courts, et cetera, um, there's very little risk that you get cross-correlation within the portfolio or that you get the so-called dom domino effect. So it is really interesting from a you know, taking pure idiosyncratic risk uh, perspective for a financial investor. Now, that being said, you know, uh, when we talk about Europe and, and the types of cases, I mean, there's the same types of cases that you may see everywhere else, except that, you know, you have to be a bit agile and efficient in the way you handle new claims and new jurisdictions you haven't dealt with before. And it's true that, you know, a certain claim that was successful in the U.S. or the U.K. may, may simply not work in France or Switzerland for a variety of reasons. It may be for uh, you know, liability matters, but it may be as well for enforcement or just timing. So we have to be quite agile. I'd say you know, um, try to internalize as much of the work as possible and try to work in partnership with the claimant and the law firm as much as possible. I think we do uh, work hand in hand with the claimant council uh, very much more than in the US and the UK, I'd say. And then uh, when there's a necessity to analyze a very precise point, a very precise technical matter, then, then we, we seek legal specialist advice in a specific jurisdiction on that point. Um, I mean, nowadays, really the hot topic in continental Europe is private enforcement, anything that's follow-on related, really interesting from a financial perspective. Uh, but you know, uh, these days I look a lot of at uh, litigation for family-owned businesses, uh, which I think is a big area of interest and in, in opportunity in continental Europe, so very broad. Okay, good. So now, going to the lawyers, so uh, Carlos and Chris, in your own day-to-day -day lives, what are you seeing in terms of trends? What kind of claims are out there? What's getting funded? So I know we talked about some of the particular structures in Spain. So why don't we, and, and the ease with which things can be transferred and how that is feeding the market. So why don't we start with that? Sure. So we have been discussing about access to justice and to providing liquidity to both corporates and the firms, which of course are extremely important but there is another key driver which explains one of the latest trends in Spain, which is profitability. One of the good things about claims, contingent assets, is that these are not registered in the balance sheet. So it's possible to basically get an income if that claim can be sold off. And that's possible in Spain. 
we don't have champer tea maintenance or other issues. We have our own technicalities, but we can handle those through portfolios or through the assignment of proceeds instead of claims. So if CFOs are usually interested in listening about litigation financing, CLOs are thrilled when they learn that the in-house department can move from a cost center into a profit center. Uh, and of course, from the investor's perspective, that helps spread the risk, offer a better pricing, and as a matter of fact, to get exclusivity with big corporates. Yeah, and, and so what are, are there some examples of that that people might have heard of in the Spanish market in terms of the types of claims that have been structured like that? I think that in the, the telecommunications market, the construction markets are two names that are public, which are Telefonica and Acciona. And as far as type of claims, a trend that we are increasingly seeing are tax refunds. And this is interesting because sponsors are also keen on listening to litigation financing. So essentially, when there is a change in tax law or in the interpretation of the tax authorities, companies have two choices. They either pay the tax, which undermines profitability, or they take on the audit and sanction risk, which is not acceptable. So increasingly, they are basically paying the tax and then seeking a tax refund. Of course, this is going to be long and costly lit litigation. But again, monetization of funding, it's interesting because otherwise, sponsors may not even be able to liquidate the DSPB or whatever. So I have my very smart tax colleagues, which are also in this, in this conference. So they raise an opportunity, which is scalable in the market. And as a law firm, it's also interesting for us, because we can get also a larger piece of the size of the cake, and we don't have to enter into value destructive strategies in terms of competing in costs, and instead offering interesting opportunities to our clients. So again, we think that this is a win-win for everyone. It is a win-win for the investor, it is a win-win for the company, and also for the law firm. Yeah. Good. So Chris, you know, you're based in the Netherlands, and I know there's been some discussion earlier today about class actions in the Netherlands, so we should let's touch on that. But then you've also, your, your business itself has expanded into France. And so you, you might be able to talk a little bit about some of the trends in the market and types of claims in yeah. both of those jurisdictions. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's correct, Mark. And uh, I, I know I'm speaking also on behalf of uh, Carlos and Hugo that, that we as Europeans are very sorry that we're the only male panel here today. But that's more or less uh, the, way, the way things are. This is uh, post-Brexit. It's uh, bullying, I think, eh, that the Europeans are put in the all male panels. Uh, with we, an American. We have with an American. With this, which yeah. is, you know, clearly a punishment. <laughs> exactly. But we have women in Europe. Um, and, and, and in the Netherlands, uh, this morning, uh, the, the, the W word was mentioned. Um, this is our new legal regime as of the 1st of January 2020. It's called WAMKA, not WEMKA. <laughs> or Wimka, Vamka. So if you're a, a cool funder, you learn to pronounce Vamka. <laughs> and as of the 1st of January 2020, uh, we've seen an yeah, a a enormous amount of cases coming, especially to the Netherlands, under this new, uh, under this new regime, because it allows an opt-out uh, dam opt damages claims. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of traction there. This is not the situation our Paris office is in. Uh, in France, they don't have an opt-out regime, or Hugo can discuss that a little, about that a little bit, but they have a fiduciary regime, which is slightly different. Uh, they have similar opt-out regimes in Belgium and in Portugal, but this is all what I know about. So, so there are not too many opt-out regimes in, in Europe, and the benefit in the Netherlands is that um, uh, litigating there is relatively cheap. Dutch like that, relatively cheap, no adverse costs, uh, so you don't uh, need to pay the costs of the uh, 
if, if you lose the case uh, of, the, uh, of the defendants, the quality of judges, uh, judiciary, is relatively high. And uh, we have been saying that uh, proceedings can be swift, but the examples we are seeing so far uh, deny that more or less because things are going slowly, slowly. So it's very much early days. Um, it's funny because today I'm seeing a lot of people in the room that I've only seen during COVID uh, conferences. Uh, and it's really great to see them now in, uh, in person, uh, Hugo much taller than I thought <laughs> next to me. No, but it's really funny too, it's, it's really great and, and, and I thank Elena for organizing this, uh, this conference uh, it's, and her team of course. It's really, it's great, really great, uh, great to be here. Uh, but lots of opportunities in the Netherlands and I would say, in my, my Paris office would be offended if I don't say, lots of opportunities in Paris also. They are doing a lot of uh, cartel damages claims in the Paris office. Okay. And so, Hugo, from an investor's point of view, let's talk about class actions, the EU directive on collective redress and how, how you see that as an opportunity. I mean, theoretically, on paper, it's, uh, it's super exciting, right? Class actions, when you think about it from a funder's perspective, is where you get the most uh, asymmetry potential, right? Um, that's where you get to deploy the most cash because there's abilities to you know, finance but also purchase claims. and. Uh, um, you know, generally speaking, you can look at other jurisdictions because product liability, mass stored consumer cases will generally have uh, been undertaken somewhere else. Um, so there's ability to sort of take a peek into other jurisdictions and use that in underwriting. Now, all that being said, it's very new. Um, and, you know, we say litigation funding is binary, but we're in the business of not taking too much binary risk. So um, being a first mover isn't necessarily always the best decision in terms of risk taking and funding. So, um, and I mean, we've looked at a few opportunities in France and we've looked at a few opportunities in a few jurisdictions and I'd say so far, the Netherlands and the UK have been the most attractive. Um, otherwise, you have to find sort of ways, tricks in the structuring to actually get comfortable with the early stage binary risk. Uh, one thing I'd say as well, and that's very true in the Netherlands, um, is all this attractivity of class actions has brought a lot of money. Uh, and when you say a lot of money, it's, it's, you know, it's millions and hundreds of millions sometimes from across the, uh, the channel, but across the Atlantic as well. And that creates situations where there are carriage disputes and we don't know how they're going to be dealt with as well. And you know, this was something that was touched upon earlier in the UK. It's the same in, uh, in the Netherlands and elsewhere. So you know, we're, we're cautiously uh, excited, cautiously optimistic. Um, we're following very closely with, uh, with litigators, with scholars, the evolution. We're looking at what's happening in Spain and Portugal because there's a lot of uh, commentary and, and decisions coming out. So, um, so look, it's going to be an interesting market, but you have to keep a cool head. You know, there's no, uh, you shouldn't develop FOMO around class actions, I think is important. And um, really take the time to, uh, um, to structure deals that make sense and that are going to be, uh, you know, judge proof because um, you know, pricing 50% uh, on your funding agreement is simply not going to fly. Right. And uh, to be fair, when you talk about uh, a lot of the class action frameworks are actually uh, meant to be orchestrated by consumer associations in Europe, uh, and they're not necessarily the most right-winged entities. Um, so when a capitalist comes in and asks for a share of the proceeds, there's usually an interesting debate setting in. Um, we've approached a few consumer associations in Belgium and in France, and um, you know there's a lot of education uh, work to be done right now. But but the, the the implementation of the collective redress directive is going to help with that because yeah. of course, um, as this is all new, uh, you, uh, you have to train uh, not only consumer organisations but also the judiciary. Um, in, well, can can in somebody what, just what a, give a quick a overview does. for what the directive is supposed to do? Well, it, 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 it's a directive, um, so that means it's not a total uh, harmonization, it's minimum harmonization to a certain extent, but it allows uh, EU member states to implement an opt-out regime. Uh, so a regime that is similar to the regime that we currently have in the Netherlands. Uh, so you can claim damages on behalf of a group uh, without doing a book build or only a very limited uh, book build effort which is, of course, very attractive to, uh, to funders. Uh, the directive uh, will enter into force in June next year. It needs to be implemented uh, by the end of this year. Um, and it varies from country to country where these countries are going. So 
uh, one member state will opt for the opt-out uh, possibility, but others will uh, shun away from that. So it's very interesting to see how the different member states will, uh, will approach that. There's also the possibility of pan-European actions. Uh, so you can do an opt-out in the Netherlands with an opt-in from other member states, so you can combine claims. Uh, so in theory, it's going to be extremely helpful to get access to justice. Um, but of course, the entire funding market, as, as everybody in the room knows, requires, as Hugo said, education. And it requires that we explain what a funder does and how these cases work. Um, and it's, and, uh, for instance, under the, under the Vamkar regime and also under the uh, directive, everybody accept, accepts that a funder gets return on his investment. But we don't know how much. Uh, so that's a big issue. Yeah, and in Spain, we talked a little bit about class actions, so those are happening now. So we do have class actions in Spain, so we have an opt-out mechanism, but the standing is limited to consumers' associations. So what we see in practice are group actions, basically opt-in as a matter of fact. And in terms of structuring those deals, it's not that easy if we focus on claimants it's definitely best if we can focus on the SPV or the law firm, both in terms of insolvency remoteness yeah. and then to basically have one person to negotiate with instead of a lot of people in an opt-in regime. Yeah, and so there's a structuring strategy to make that work. Right. Yeah. I'll say this, um, taking sort of a 10,000 feet view and maybe a different angle, um, you know, in terms of money flowing into the, what, what I call, what we call an asset class, which is legal assets for litigation finance, I think class actions in Europe are going to be very positive. Um, you know, a lot of investors today are happy to make returns funding class actions in the US and Australia, and, but at the end of the day, you know, people also want to put money at work close to home, so I think it's going to be interesting from a AUM perspective yeah, for so, funders. Yeah, so on that, just Europe, I mean, this is a, meant to be a, an investment focused conference. You're looking at things, looking at litigation funding as an asset class. And so when you look at Europe at a high level, you are sitting in the middle of Europe now as an investor. And so w what are the advantages of investing in Europe? I mean, what, what is the, the sales pitch for litigation funding in Europe. And I suppose there's a couple of different angles to that. There's you who are sitting there doing it. And inevitably, you may be developing a certain position in the market that is an advantage for you. But just in terms of attracting money, what is the? I mean, I mean generally speaking, you know, um, a lot of institutional investors do have sort of geographical allocation targets yeah. uh, in the buckets when you're a Swiss investor is larger for, you know, the DAC region than Australia or Asia Pacific. Um, so it's certainly helping us uh, fit into um, that box. You know, at the end of the day, there's only as much capital we can invest that as, as we raise, right? So, um, so that's helping. I'd say in terms of the types of actions that we're seeing in Europe that make the headlines, or at least that we can talk about, you know, everything that relates to competition cases, cartels, private enforcement, and whatnot, that's also in the news. Um, and the fact it being in the news helps us sort of you know, communicate on what we do. Yeah. Institutional investors do not generally like black box C strategies, you know, bad memories from uh, hedge funds and side pockets. Um, so they like to see what they're invested in. And, and previously, you know, in Europe, most of the funding was uh, international arbitration out of Paris, Geneva, and that's, that's, you know, that's super private. You can communicate, it's on a no-name basis. It wasn't really exciting, um, just in terms of case studies when you fundraise. Uh, we actually have a lot more storytelling abilities nowadays. Um, so, you know, Europe, uh, the way it's developing is certainly attractive uh, from that angle. Uh, and we are, you know, we've been, I mean, I, I certainly have been going around uh, investors and law firms for the past six years in, you know, major capitals in Europe, sort of doing the education. And when you go to uh, you know, top 10 litigation practices in, in Paris uh, five years ago, they had never heard or used litigation funding. Now I think it's changing, uh, which is good. Uh, we're seeing a lot more deals happening in Europe as well. Um, so you know, as, as a European-based funder, it certainly is helping. Um, and you know, I now hear that um, German endowments, Swiss pension funds are invested in funds. I think that's completely new. You know, we knew uh, US, US pension funds were invested, some UK pension funds, but 
if the super institutional money comes in, I think we're uh, that much closer to litigation funding becoming an asset class. Um, and, and you know, that's, that's very positive for everybody here. And Chris, do you have some experience in your own work in terms of seeing sources of money coming from different places into Europe? Yes. Well, we, as I said during uh, during the, the the Corona years, we've been we, we've been having weekly conversations with uh, with different types of funders uh, uh, with a variety of, uh, of backgrounds, uh, and also discussions about portfolio funding. That was the topic of the previous uh, previous panel. Uh, I, I must say, for portfolio funding, um, I think it's still, in the Netherlands at least, a little early to do that. I think it's very interesting, but if you look at uh, the amount of firms that are actually handling uh, litigation cases, class action cases, as, as claimants, uh, Adrian this morning compared the funding market a few years ago to a village, uh, well, it's very much still a village in, in Amsterdam. So I think there are about seven or eight firms that focus strictly on litigation in the Netherlands. Bureau of Brandeis is probably the largest of that, uh, of that group. So it's, you don't want to be completely dependent on a single funder or a single portfolio. So as a firm, we would also like to see a certain spread, spread or risk also, um, like you're doing with portfolio funding. But I think it's very interesting. We had some very interesting conversations, especially in looking at the possibility to add ESG funding to a portfolio. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there are quite a few opportunities there. Yeah. And in terms of pricing, inevitably, uh, when you have lots of new money coming in, that must have an impact for you, Hugo, in terms of uh, how deals are getting done and the pressure. If, if, for example, Dutch class actions, yeah, there's, I mean, large hedge funds are, you know, crossing the Atlantic to put yeah. money to work. So for sure, it's, it's, it's pressuring the, the returns. Uh, that's for sure. But the, the rule of general, the general rule is that in Europe, um, if you're um, originating directly, right, and, um, and you're evaluating an opportunity, it's rare to actually come across another funder. Um, maybe one in 10 cases, there's another funder involved. So I mean, in terms of competition? Or? Yeah, in terms of competition or in terms of, there's not so much a shopping around culture. Uh, when you look at most cases, the very large and very visible cases, yes, but most other cases, no. So that means that you're able to focus the discussion around the term sheet on, on pricing and take time to have pricing that reflects milestones, you know, risk tolerance and certain targets of the company as opposed to, you know, what's the cheapest. And, and sometimes, you know, shopping around is, is certainly good for managing, you know, uh, how much you recover uh, of the final uh, pie, right? But what about the covenants, you know? What about all the obligations you have under the funding agreement? How is the funding agreement going to be structured and viewed in terms of taxes, you know, when, the com when that comes back? Is it, uh, you know, is it efficient uh, in terms of actual legal structuring? And these conversations you really can't have and take the time to have when you're in Europe because it's not as competitive and it's not as much of a high-speed market yet. So. That, that's certainly quite interesting for us yeah. as funders. Uh, and that, that, that inevitably will change. That, that will change, but for now, uh, that's where we sit. So, uh, you know, we, we've got some pricing power, but we've also got some power to make the funding agreements livable. Because remember, you're embarking on a, you know, in Europe, it's four to seven years uh, of your life <laughs> that you're going to spend with guys like me. Uh, so you want to make sure that we work well together and that you're comfortable with what you're signing. Um, so for now, that's how it is, and uh, it for sure will change, but you know, we're, we're early in the market, so we're benefiting from that for sure. Go ahead, Carlos, please. Well, I think, Mark, that uh, in terms of pricing, but most importantly, of getting deals through, the alliance between funders and, and insurers have proved extremely important, at least in, in Spain. So for example, maybe a typical risk is not insurable, but then, maybe a funder is willing to invest into that opportunity, but maybe that funder is not able to provide attractive terms. However, if they couple, maybe the insurance company has appetite to basically protect the invested amount of the funder, which is a percentage of the litigation risk at issue. So that alliance, again, has permitted to get some deals through and also to compete in terms of pricing. 
That, that's that, to be just to add to that. I think that's completely true, and and that's where we're getting into the whole asset class discussion. You know, like in real estate, you can do early stage bridge lending or senior financing on developed uh, uh, assets, and it's the same in litigation funding. Thanks to mechanisms like like uh, the insurance, you can bring senior funding backed by you know capital protection insurance and sort of subordinated funding that's a bit more expensive, and then an equity piece that pays for the premium and do some sort of structuring work to bring different pieces, different types of you know, cost of capital and get actions funded. Um, now it's easier said than done because you know, most uh, insurers are, are used to common law and, and certain jurisdictions. So um, you need to also think about um, that side of the equations. But to the extent you can have some proper financial and insurance structuring on a deal, that, that's just beneficial uh, ultimately for, for everybody. But that also requires time. You know, if you're uh, going to want to close in two weeks, that's just not going to happen. So um, you need time for everybody to go through committee, their due diligence process, align, and then piece it all together. So Education as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, certainly, I mean, there's been discussions on other panels around that. I mean, the insurance market nowadays is, is certainly a, a huge source of, uh, uh, of, of capital, at least uh, helps mobilize a lot of capital for, from, from investors, and that's, that's just providing a lot of options for claimants, so very beneficial. Yeah, and I know it was covered to some degree earlier, but uh, things, investment themes like diversity and ESG seem to be becoming part of the landscape in litigation funding, too, and I know we talked a little bit about this when we were speaking before the panel, but does anybody have some experiences with ESG-related things that they, they could share in, in Europe? Well, I, I think there was, uh, in, the, in the ESG panel, there was, for instance, mentioned about the diesel em emission cases. Yeah. That's a uh, type of case that, that my firm handles quite, quite a lot. Uh, and there's a floodgate of uh, data privacy cases currently going on. Uh, you can call that ESG cases, but they, they, uh, they do have uh, a positive effect on on society, and in these cases, it's it's quite common to cooperate with civil society in in, in handling the cases because uh, you need, to, as I explained, you don't need to book build, but you need to show as a foundation that you're representative. And one of the solutions has been so far. We're not sure whether this is going to work eventually, but it's been so far is to. Uh, work together with civil society organizations, uh, for instance, privacy organizations, to get these cases going. And the interesting part is, of course, these are all cases against big U.S. tech companies uh, that we all know about. Uh, there are currently a lot of these cases going on. There's actually uh, uh, one. There, there, there's a competing case against TikTok, where free foundations are currently uh, taking on a TikTok offer data privacy violations. And I do think. Um, uh, that if you can tie those types of cases, uh, if you can make money on them, if they're, if they're profit making, if you can do some good for society, um, if you can uh, get some legal innovation in place, I think it's a, it's a very I interesting mix for, for all parties concerned. Yeah. Can we do some questions? Does anybody have some questions for the panel? I think Wiegler has a question. Well, I was thinking about one. <laughs> I think the, the microphone's coming, why don't we? You think it's a question to you, but it's not. No, I know. <laughs> okay, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Wiegler Wielinga. I'm with uh, Omni Bridgeway, which okay. is a funder. My question is to Hugo. Um, you talked a bit about these tax refund cases, right? Are these... Yeah, so what's the structure that you would recommend to do these cases? I think assignment is a bit of an issue, right? Well, that depends on what you're going to purchase. Because you can purchase, in general, claims or proceeds. Proceeds is like a securitization-like scheme. And that works well. Not least because there is a perfect alignment of incentives. So if the defendant is not willing to pay to the claimant, least to the funder, right? So that has proved a very good solution in practice. And you're right. In Spain, you cannot assign a tax refund, but you can do assign the tax proceeds. So the terms is how you structure that depending on who your client is. Because you want insolvency remoteness, to avoid commingling and other related issues, right? 
and we can structure around that. Yeah. Anders. Yes, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about these massive class action lawsuits. Uh, where do you, as as a funder, and where do you, on the other side, see duration as being important to the funders? Because they, they seem like they're very, they're, it's not cases where people are rolling over easily on, on these cases. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's a big issue. Um, not so much because we're expecting you know, five, seven year durations is because we don't know where it's going to go and there's potential for appeal at the European level. So, you know, you've got to be ready to, uh, first of all, you've got to budget for everything because, you know, if there's unforeseen appeals, you know, um, running short of budget is certainly not good. And, and as far as we stand, you know, we operate with a closed-ended fund model, so there's only that much capital that we have and, you know, we need to, uh, to anticipate the fact that, you know, the next fund may only come later and whatnot. So you, you need to budget for the worst case scenario and then add 20% to that. I think this resonates with someone on this panel. Um, but so that's the first thing. Uh, you need to price what budget wide for uncertainty. Now, um, there are other mechanisms, fundamental and synthetic, to manage duration. Obviously, the insurance market offers a lot of solutions to manage duration. Um, so there's a, th there needs to be obviously risk alignment and alignment of interest in the way the transaction is structured. Uh, but that's one solution. And then there's a, a market which is nascent, uh, but you can pre-strike agreements, I guess, around uh, secondary exits or refinancings. And I think when we start talking about that, again, we just take it back to where the private equity or the private debt market was you know, 15 years ago, and we look at where it is today and how that's developed. So it's all about starting these conversations early from the onset. So for example, the class actions that we funded, you know, we, we actually had some discussions around you know, if we take this through you know, exclusive representative uh, appointment, uh, would you be willing to step in or de-risk us? And you know, we, we've got these discussions already before funding. So that's one way to manage. Uh, obviously, uh, then it's, it's your work to, to make sure the cash is there the day you need it. Um, but you know, it's, it's not unlike other transactions with duration uh, components or you know, uh, private equity or the VC market is dependent on, on the IPO market or, you know, the state of the, the, the market appetite generally to exit. You know, I, I think about duration and class actions in the same way. Um, so. No, it's, it's an it's a excellent question because it's a big issue. And of course, it's not only the judiciary that has it in, it, in its hand. Uh, the defendants will do everything to uh, prolong the litigation as much as possible. Um, and, and, and time is money. Uh, so the longer it takes, uh, the more expensive it becomes. So it's very difficult um, in, in the type of cases I'm handling. You also have the prospect of uh, referral cases to the ECJ, uh, which may also increase costs. Uh, so there are quite a lot of insecurities and, and, and our focus should be on ensuring that these cases get to, get, get to an end judgment as soon as possible. Yeah. To, to be fair, in class actions, specifically the ones that we're talking about here, which are quite large uh, by nature, because the, the, the pool of victims is, is relatively spread out and, 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 and deep, there's so much room, I guess, for the funder, even at reasonable pricing, to make decent, a really decent multiple that it can absorb time passing, essentially. So that's why the large actions will probably be the, the best candidates early on. And then more modest class actions will get funding once we've gone through the novelty element. Um, but for sure, at first, it's going to be your 1 billion claims or 500 million claims that will get funding because you've got enough um, to actually price a decent you know, time-adjusted return. Let me, let me put it this way. At first sight, I would see duration as a selling point to the corporate. The complexity and the duration of the case is a business opportunity. Now it comes the challenge, how to mitigate that risk and that cost. And again, insurance. Insurers can basically give indemnity if uh, a certain return is not obtained in a certain duration. So again, to me in my experience, those challenges are exactly the selling points in the industry to, to clients at the end of the day. And then the other players in the industry can help 
go through that bridge. Thank you. One more question. The microphone is coming. There you go. Again, Adam Kovacic. I wonder how do you perceive jurisdiction in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, do you assume an additional risk factor to jurisdictions like Poland and, and uh, Hungary in the perspective of rule of law and the most recent you know, develop, political development in those countries? Is that for me? Yeah. Uh, I, can, uh, I, I can respond to that. I think uh, the uh, rule of law in, in Poland and in Hungary is extremely troubling. Um, so I think that's a very good point you made. Uh, at the same time, uh, both countries are, are European member states and they will have to implement all the European directives. So I have no idea how Hungary and Poland, for instance, will implement the Collective Redress Directive. Uh, but what we're seeing is that in certain areas of law, uh, for instance Poland, uh, can be quite innovative uh, at the same time. So it's difficult to predict. Uh, we have an excellent uh, advocate general at the, at the European Court who's Polish. Uh, so the, 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 the current situation is very troubling. Uh, and of course, we had a, a new election in, in Hungary recently. Uh, but at some point in time, government may change and we'll have a different, different situation. Um, yeah. If, if I just add one thing to that, I guess. Um, I, Poland and, and certain Eastern European jurisdictions have great legal talent in terms of you know, litigators and arbitration counsel, and but they come at a fraction of the hourly rate. So if you very coldly think about you know the cost to damages ratio, you also get some interesting opportunities there. So selectively, you know it's uh, it, we're not it's there is a rule of law and there is a court system that functions. Now we hear about you know duration and, and political risk there, but um, to the extent you work on a claim that you're you're feeling good about that has the right you know, cost to damages ratio, um, you know there's no reason why Poland would be less attractive than Italy, for instance. You know, um, so it's something we'd consider. Now it's it's true that and that's more limited partners sort of driving that uh, these these decisions these days. You know, we're uh, less keen to fund cases in jurisdictions that are bordering Ukraine or Russia. Um, and that's not real, really rational per se. Um, it's just, um, you know, just the general sentiment. If we're seen as, uh, as taking bets in this uh, area of, uh, of, of Europe, may not be perceived uh, very well by, by LP. So again, I mean, certainly I'm speaking from a, an asset manager point of view where, you know, we invest our clients' money. So we have to think about how they perceive our moves. Um, but generally speaking, uh, Eastern Europe is attractive. Um, and even so, if you're able to enforce a judgment outside of Eastern Europe uh, where there's assets, then that, that also can make it very, very attractive for us. And that's a perfect segue to the next panel on enforcement and monetization. So please, well, first of all, thank you all. That was great. So thank you, Carlos. And you go and Chris.